joy of the Mr. Chips of Davidson County. Thank you. <laughs> uh, delighted. This may be the most extraordinary gathering of talent in one place, with the possible exception of when Doris dines alone. <laughs> so, welcome. Um, He's impossible. We get, <laughs> but we get her passport stamped whenever she comes south of the Charles River, and so <laughs> be gentle with her. Um, she told me earlier today how much she loved the L'Hermitage Hotel. Oh, stop! I, uh... <laughs> not, not since John Kerry ordered Swiss on his Philly cheesesteak <laughs> has there been a, uh, a greater moment of a Massachusetts <laughs> discovering America. Uh, we'll have simultaneous translation for, <laughs> for you, dear. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is going, my friend. Yeah, we're, <laughs> my great friend. That's true. I love him. That's true. Uh, we're going to jump right in because uh, this is a book about the men in your life. <laughs> and so tell us why these tributaries came together at this particular moment for you. Well, what happens is usually when I finish a book, say on Roosevelt and go to Lincoln or on Lincoln and go to Teddy and Taft, I feel this great sense of guilt because I have to move all that president's books out of my study into another part of the house, like I'm leaving an old boyfriend behind. <laughs> you do get connected to these people, as you know so well. In fact, I, I wake up with them in the morning. I think about them when I go to bed at night. My only fear is, if after having spent a lifetime looking into dead presidents' lives, that um, there'll be a panel after I die, <laughs> and they'll all be there in the afterlife and they'll tell me every single thing I got wrong about them. And the first person to scream out, of course, will be Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> How come that damn book on the Roosevelt's was twice as long as the book you wrote about me? <laughs> so anyway, I have these guys, and I feel guilty. My old boyfriend's left behind. I thought, I really, do I really want to write another 10-year book about Millard Fillmore or Franklin Pierce or whoever it might be or James Buchanan? So I decided instead I'd take the four that I felt closest to. Um, which would be Abraham Lincoln, the two Roosevelts, and LBJ, and look at them through the lens of leadership. Even though leadership was in these other books, these other books are these big, fat, sprawling biographies about their colleagues, their families, their friends, and leadership is a theme, but an undercurrent. And when I was in graduate school in government, we used to stay up at night, as nerdy as it sounds, asking these big questions. If we'd be reading Plato and Aristotle, you know, where does ambition come from? What is a good government? Can the man make the times, or the times make the man? Is y'all were, were a lot of fun. <laughs> they are. <laughs> well, we were having wine while we did oh. it, I promise. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, is leadership in board? It really was. It was, you're a young person, and these are big questions. How do you get purpose in life? You know, can you be a leader if you're not ethical? All these huge questions that I decided would be fun to look at directly. So I thought it would take me only a couple years. Of course, it took five years, because I hadn't really thought about these in direct detail. And it was a great adventure to look at my guys and figure out when was that moment when they first realized this was their vocation. I mean, something that I think we think about, too. For each one of them, I started when they're young, so that um, people could aspire to, to become one of them. I was at a college audience one time, and a kid raised his hand when I was talking about the Roosevelts, and he said, um, I can never become one of them. They're in Mount Rushmore. You know, they're, um, they're on the currencies. They're in movies. It's too far removed. So I decided to start when they were 23, 24, 25, 26, when they run for office the first time. And then we'll see them struggle. We'll see them make mistakes. We'll see them have to learn from their cockiness. And maybe we can learn from their leadership. So just by beginning there, I had to go back and learn a lot more than I knew because I hadn't really studied that part of them. So it turned out the title was because each one of them lived in turbulent times. Obviously, Lincoln in the Civil War, Teddy at the turn of the 20th century when there was so much turmoil in the economy, FDR in the Depression, and Lyndon Johnson with the assassination of JFK, and then the um, Civil Rights Movement heating up and, and not knowing where the racial tensions would come. 
I never knew when I cho chose that title so many years ago that it was going to be relevant today, even more so. <laughs> but it was, it, it's been a lot of fun to just be able to go back to my guys and live with them once more. I guess I just didn't want to let them go, to be honest. <laughs> so what was the, uh, just running through them quickly, what was the crucible in their 20s for Lincoln? What was Lincoln's? Well, I think just starting before the crucible, because that happens a little bit later for him, the interesting thing about Lincoln is he decides at the age of 23 that he's going to run for the state legislature in New Salem, this little community where he's just moved six months before. And in those days, you had to put out a handbill to tell people why you were running. And his is unbelievable. I mean, it starts, it just shows that he's otherworldly even then. He said, every man has his peculiar ambition, he began. Mine is to be esteemed of by my fellow man, to make myself worthy of their esteem. Even then, he's thinking of something larger than himself. Most people, my other three guys, go into politics for themselves at first. And later, if you're lucky and it's true for them, ambition for self becomes something larger, ambition for the greater good. Lincoln had it at the start. Then he says, I don't have any popular relations to recommend me. If the good voters decide to reject me, I won't be very much disappointed because I'm used to disappointment. But then he says, amazingly, he said, but I'll let you know if I lose, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to try. I'm going to try again and again. In fact, I think I'll try five or six times, and then it'll be so embarrassing and so humiliating that I promise you I'll never try again. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing, right? Yeah. So that even then, that resilience that he had and that perseverance was there. And so he doesn't win, as expected. But then in two years, he's made himself known throughout Sangamon County through his kindness, his effort to educate himself, the way he was with other people, his great sense of humor, his ability to speak, that he easily wins and is starting on that career. So that's him at the beginning. And you realize, of course, that without Andrew Jackson, there is no Abraham Lincoln. Clearly. Without John Meacham, there's no Andrew Jackson. Well, there without you go. <laughs> trilogies without John Meacham. There's Thank no Abraham Lincoln. We appreciate you coming out. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Andrew Jackson gave him his first appointment. Postmaster of Salem. Exactly so. <clears throat> no, you, you're absolutely right. No, that, and that was important to keep him going in between these elections. Um, but I think what you're talking about, if we just stick with Lincoln and then maybe we can go to the other yeah. guys, is that when, so he's in the state legislature and he's doing pretty well. But what he had promised in that first handbill was that he would bring infrastructure to his little community um, so that poor farmers could get their goods to market, so that little towns could develop and they wouldn't be so lonely in their little farms as they were, as his own father had been. And he sponsored this incredible, it was called Internal Improvements then, yes. but an infrastructure project. They were going to build harbors and roads. And then the state, went, they were half built. The state goes into a recession. None of the projects are finished. The state goes into debt, and he's blamed for this. And he feels terrible, not just because it failed, but he had given his word, and his word was not then um, kept. He said the chief gem of his character was to give his word. And at the same time, he broke his engagement with Mary Todd. Not certain, the old expression then was that his hand was going with his heart, which meant that he probably wasn't sure that he was in love with her. And she was humiliated. He felt horrible that he'd broken his word to her. So he cycled into what John is talking about, the crucible of depression. And he was so sad that people took all knives and razors and scissors from his room. They said he didn't even look like himself. He, he was really, in a sense, nearly dying. And his great friend Joshua Speed comes to his side and says, Lincoln, you must rally or you will die. And he said, I know that. And I would just as soon die right now but I've not yet accomplished anything to make any human being remember that I have lived. So even then, that desire becomes the thing that keeps him going, that worthy ambition. And he gets back and finishes his term in the state legislature, runs for Congress, has only a single term, loses twice for the Senate, and eventually runs for the presidency. And the rest is history. That's right. Thank God. <laughs> exactly. What about TR? So what happens to Teddy is he runs at 23 too just like Lincoln, but very different. Obviously, coming from a privileged background, they come to him and say, you know, it would be good for him if he wanted to run for the state legislature. He came from the Silk Stocking District. They knew his father had been a well-known philanthropist, so his name would have a certain resonance. And he admitted, unlike Lincoln's desire to go in to be esteemed of by other fellow men, 
he admitted that he didn't go in for the hope of making anybody's lives better. He just wanted the adventure of politics. But then what happened, and this is when a, a wide political career really can make a difference in a person's life. When he gets in the state legislature, he's, he goes to tenements where they're making cigars and people are living in these tenements. And at first he was a laissez-faire guy. We can't do anything about it. He sees the miserable conditions. It changes his mind. He then is police commissioner and he walks the slums at night in disguise between midnight and 5 a.m. to see what the streets are really like in New York. He becomes a soldier. He's sharing hardtack with his soldiers. And he begins to develop what I think is one of the most important qualities in a leader, fellow feeling, he calls it, or empathy. He said, at first, you might feel conscious when you go into these other places and you've come from this privileged background. But after a while, it becomes less, less conscious and more internal. And he became a much more empathetic person. And then he also learned when he was in the state legislature, it may sound a little familiar, he would scream and yell and pound his desk and say all these crazy things about Democratic opponents. And then it was headlines in New York. He mastered the, the communication of the time, but he couldn't get anything done. He said, I rose like a rocket and I fell like a rocket. And so he then moderated his histrionic rhetoric. He reached across the aisle to the Democrats from the Republicans and he gradually developed himself as a leader. So that's the thing. Some qualities are inborn. I think Lincoln was born with empathy, um, and Teddy had to develop it, and these other characters are different as well. FDR and empathy is the, perhaps the ultimate crucible. Without a question. I mean, when, when FDR first goes into office, he's 28 years old, and he hasn't done anything particularly noteworthy. He was an indifferent student at Harvard and at Groton and then Columbia Law. He was working in a Wall Street law firm. And they come to him, too. The Dutchess County Democrats say, we have a safe seat if you want to run for it. And, and he immediately says yes. Interestingly, they didn't choose him because he had the makings of a leader. They chose him because they thought maybe some old Republicans might think he's Teddy Roosevelt and they'd get him mixed up. And because his mother had money to do about it. But in, he, as soon as he got out on that campaign trail, he realized this is what he wanted to be. He was great at Barnstorm. He loved listening to people. He loved talking to them. And he wasn't so good speaking at the beginning. Eleanor, who was there at the time, said he would pause so long between sentences. She was afraid he'd never go on. But then by the end of the campaign, he was talking so long, she had to come and drag him off the stage. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I mean, the ultimate crucible. So he was a good politician. He was a natural. He was easy with people. But when he got the polio, it changed his way of thinking about what he was doing in public life. I mean, it is said by his um, colleague, Francis Perkins, that he emerged from that experience completely warm-hearted, able to deal with other people to whom fate had dealt an unkind hand. When he was down at Warm Springs, when he, the rehab center that he set up to try and help his fellow polio patients, he said nothing mattered as much to him as being old Doc Roosevelt. He was the therapy counselor. He was the swimming counselor. He, he, he not only taught the fellow patients to try and exercise their limbs in this giant warm pool, he had done that for years, trying to strengthen his body. You know, it was said that for years, he, he was really in a depression for a period of time. And then he finally decided, I'm just going to do whatever I have to do to try and see if I can walk again. So he would have them lift him from the wheelchair onto the carpet floor. And he, for hours, would crawl around the floor, just strengthening his back and his chest muscles. And each time he accomplished something, when he would get going up the stairs one at a time, hoisting himself on the banisters, he'd get to the top and they'd have a big champagne reception because I'd done something. So he said to somebody later, if, if you have pressures in the presidency, it's easy. If you spend two years trying to move your frozen big toe and you finally do it, you know what small triumphs are about. Anyway, so at Warm Springs, he has wheelchair dances, he has theatricals, they play water polo and tag, and he learns that sense of what it's like to make other people feel a sense of purpose again in their lives. And of course, when he gets to the depression and the paralysis of the country, who was better fit at that moment to give that contagious optimism and hope to the people than, than FDR? What about LBJ? He's always an outlier. I mean, I think he wanted to be president, or he wanted to be at least in politics from the time he's two. His father is in the state legislature. He follows his father around on the campaign trail. Um, he loves nothing more than going with him places. And he loves listening to the father talk to the cronies. So he decides. Power, that's what I want, power, even early on. So when he gets to, this, to the college where he's going, um, he decides, how do you get power? You get close to the people who have power. Well, that's the president of the college. So he takes a job mopping floors outside the president's office so he can talk to the president. 
And he begins to talk to him. Before you know it, he's so interesting. The president invites him inside to be his messenger. Before you know it, he's a clerk. Before you know it, he's running the president's office. And, but then the interesting thing that happens to him is that and he runs the school. He puts up his friend for the, for the best person there. And all his life, he becomes a person who looks for mentors. So eventually, it's Sam Rayburn and Richard Russell. And, but before that, he goes as chief of staff to a, a congressman who's just been elected. He's now 25. And he gets to Washington, and he figures, I've got to find out who the congressional secretaries are who know the most so I can learn from them. So they're all living together in this hotel. So he goes into the bathroom every morning four different times at 10-minute intervals to brush his teeth so he could talk to more of the congressional secretaries as possible. <laughs> at night, he takes four different showers at 10-minute intervals so he can figure out who are my mentors. And they said in six months, he had learned more than people who had been there for 25 years. But the interesting thing is that even though he was gathering power, there was an experience, an ultimate experience when he was young. He took a year off from college so that he could work in a, in a school in Cotula in, in a poor Mexican-American area. And he saw the pain of prejudice on these kids' faces. And he said it really did something to him. There was a sense, even then, of purpose coming to power. And he was the everything. He was the singing coach, the debate coach. He got them equipment so that they could be athletic. And he, he did everything for them, and they, he changed these kids' lives. They wrote about it. I found these oral histories I hadn't read before. So that part of him stayed alive, even as he became a New Dealer. And then as he lost the first Senate race in 41, he turned away from that. Sometimes a crucible can make you go in a different direction, not necessarily through the wisdom and the perspective that these other people had. And so once he finally decided, I have to be conservative to win in Texas, he turned his back on FDR and the New Deal. And he then makes his way up to power. And he becomes the, the youngest majority leader in the history of the country with lots of power, but with not a sense of purpose toward which the power was being put until he has a massive heart attack six months after he's made majority leader. And he says to himself, what if I die now? What would I be remembered for? And then he started to really change in a way to go back to that person who was at Catula and he got the first civil rights bill through the Senate since Reconstruction. And then eventually, of course, civil rights becomes the legacy that he hopes will at least be there, even as the war has torn his legacy in two. So for each of them, there was that experience that I think made them transfer from ambition for self to ambition for something larger. And we'll get to how relevant that is uh, in a second. Uh, so empathy. Uh, what, are, what are the other characteristics that are the common denominators? Well, I think humility is the ability to acknowledge errors and learn from your mistakes. Um, Lincoln said that you know, each time something happened, like when the Battle of Bull Run took place and the Union soldiers ran away, he couldn't sleep. So he stayed up all night figuring out what had gone wrong in a memo. And he figured out the term of service was too short, the general was wrong, they weren't disciplined enough. As long as he could learn from it, and that's where humility comes in, then he could be smarter today he's, than he was yesterday. Resilience, we've already talked about. Um, one of my favorite qualities that they, they shared, again, LBJ is somewhat of an outlier, and it's an unheralded quality in leadership that I think is so important for all of us today, is the ability to have fine time to think, to relax and replenish your energies. In our 24-7 world, we just think we have no time. We're bringing our iPhones with us, bringing our email with us. These guys were pretty busy, right? I mean, they had a civil war, they had a depression, they had World War II, and they all found time. I mean, Lincoln actually went to the theater more than 100 times during the Civil War. He said when the lights went down and a Shakespeare play came on, for a few precious hours, he could imagine himself back at the War of the Roses and forget the war that was raging. And he said, people think my theater going a little bit strange, but I'm telling you, I would die if I couldn't take that moment to get rid of this terrible anxiety and channel my thoughts in another direction. And he also, of course, it was his great sense of humor that really gave him the this, this solace that he needed for the sadness during the war. When he was a, on, the, on the circuit in Illinois and they traveled for six months in the spring and fall, six weeks in the spring and fall, whenever they came to a tavern at night, they would listen to Lincoln tell stories. I mean, he could tell stories for hours after hour. And when he was in one of those modes, he forgot the sadness. He said it whistled off his sadness. It was better than a drop of whiskey. My favorite story that he loved to tell is the one that I finally per persuaded Daniel Day-Lewis and, and Steven Spielberg to put in the movie. As Lincoln loved to tell this story, it had to do with the revolutionary war hero, Ethan Allen. 
who went to England after the war, and the English were still upset about losing the war, so they decided to embarrass him by putting a huge picture of General George Washington in the only outhouse where he'd have to encounter it. They figured he'd be very irritated at the idea that George Washington, so noble, is in an outhouse. But he came out not upset at all. And they said, well, didn't you see George Washington there? Oh, yes, he said. I think it was the perfectly appropriate place for him. What do you mean, they said? Well, he said, there's nothing to make an Englishman shit faster than the sight of General George Washington. <laughs> and he had, he, had hundreds, he, had, he had hundreds, hundreds of these stories. So you can imagine if you're in the middle of a tough cabinet meeting that you will have to relax. Well, Teddy Roosevelt, not surprisingly, given, which we probably talked about last time I was here, given his asthma as a child, um, needed to exercise. So every afternoon, there'd be two hours of exercise. It could be a boxing match, a wrestling match, a raucous game of tennis, or his favorite was a walk in the wooded cliffs of Rock Creek Park. And he made a simple rule. You couldn't go around any obstacle. You had to go through it. So if you came to a rock, you had to climb it. If you came to a precipice, you had to go down it. So there are these stories of everybody falling by the wayside as they're trying to follow him in this stupid walk. But the best one was told by the French ambassador. He was so excited. First time he'd ever walk with Teddy. And he figured it'd be like the Champs-Élysées. He wears his silk outfit. <laughs> he finds himself in the woods. Oh my god, he can't stand it. And finally, they come to a stream. He said, thank god it's over. So then he said, judge of my horror, as I saw the president begin to unbutton his clothes and heard him say, it's an obstacle. We can't go around it. So there's no sense in getting our clothes wet. So I, too, for the honor of France, took off my apparel. However, I left on my lavender kid gloves. To be without gloves would be most embarrassing if you should meet ladies on the other side. <laughs> so, so I just kept picturing that naked amba ambassador. So then FDR, there's going to be another naked story with FDR. So FDR had a cocktail hour every night, as John so well knows, in the White House um, during the World War II. He so wanted to be able to talk about, and the rule was you couldn't talk about the war or politics. You could talk about gossip, movies you'd seen, books you'd read, as long as you didn't bring the war up. And after a while, this cocktail party mattered so much to him, he wanted the people who would be at it to be living in the White House. So the White House becomes the most exclusive residential hotel you could possibly imagine. Um, his foreign policy advisor, Harry Hopkins, comes for dinner one night, sleeps over, never leaves until the war comes to an end. <laughs> his secretary, Missy Lehand, lives there. The princess from Northway is there on the weekends. Lorena Hickok, Eleanor's friend, is there. And of course, John's friend, Winston Churchill, comes and spends weeks at a time in a room diagonally across from Roosevelt's. So when I was writing the book on the Roosevelt's, I just kept imagining all these people in their bathrobes at night on the corridor there. It's not that big, the corridor on the second floor. And wishing when I'd been up there with Lyndon Johnson, I thought of asking, where did Churchill sleep? Where was Roosevelt? Where was Harry Hopkins? But I wasn't thinking in those terms when I was 24 years old. So I mentioned this on a radio program in Washington. And it happened Hillary Clinton then there was listening. So she called me up at the radio station, invited me to sleep overnight in the White House. She said we could then wander the corridor with this sleepover and, and figure out where everyone had slept 50 years earlier. So a couple weeks later, she invited my husband and me to a state dinner, after which between midnight and 2 a.m., the president, Mrs. H Mrs. Clinton, my husband and I, with, his, with my map in hand, went through every room and figured out, yes, Harry Hopkins is sleeping where Chelsea, Clinton was, Chelsea was now sleeping, the Clintons were sleeping where FDR was. We were in Winston Churchill's bedroom. There's no way I could sleep. He was sitting in that bedroom without a question, drinking his brandy and smoking his ever-present yep. cigar. Absolutely. So anyway, the, the story of that, which is one of these wonderful apocryphal stories, it has to be true because it's so wonderful. When Churchill was there, he and Roosevelt were set to sign a document that put the Allied nations against the Axis powers. But no one liked the word associated nations that they were calling themselves. So Roosevelt awakens, let's call them the United Nations. He's so excited, wheeled into Churchill's bedroom, our bedroom, to tell him the news. But Churchill's just coming out of the tub and has nothing on. So Roosevelt says, I'm so sorry, I'll come back in a few moments. Churchill, ever able to speak in a very formal voice, said, oh no, please stay. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> so, Anyway, the only person who's an outlier, again, is Lyndon Johnson. He, he hated to go to movies because it was dark and you couldn't talk. He had, a, he, had a, he had a swimming pool at his ranch, which I would swim in with him, if you would call it swimming, because it was so filled with rafts, with floating notepads and floating telephones on it, you couldn't move in the swimming pool. <laughs> and that was sad, because he could never, he had enormous energy to start, but he could never release that energy, because he would go to the Situation Room at night and see whether the bombs had gone in the wrong direction and couldn't sleep during those. They all otherwise figured out ways to sleep, but not him. My favorite small detail about the Churchill Roosevelt story is afterward, 
FDR said to his secretary, Grace Tully, you know, Grace, he's pink and white all over. <laughs> I was asked a really interesting question uh, a couple of days ago and uh, immediately wanted to ask you. And so thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> you're, well, tell everybody, to remind everybody of your, uh, the time you spent around President Johnson. Well, it all began um, when I was 24 years old and I was a graduate student at Harvard and I became, I was applied for and, and won this White House Fellowship, a fabulous program. I mean, Colin Powell was a White House Fellow, Wesley Clark. We had a big dance at the White House the night we were selected. He did dance with me, not that peculiar. There were only three women out of the 16 <laughs> White House Fellows. But as he twirled me around the floor in these ridiculous Texan moves, I mean, it was you know one of those dips you do and you come back up. He said, I want you to be assigned directly to me in the White House. But it didn't turn out that way because in the months prior to my selection, I'd been active like many young people in the anti-Vietnam War movement and had written an article with a friend of mine which we'd sent to the New Republic, heard nothing, which suddenly came out two days after the dance in the White House and the title was they put on How to Remove Lyndon Johnson from Power. So I was certain he would kick me out of the program, but instead surprisingly he said, oh, bring her down here for a year and if I can't win her over, no one can. So I did eventually end up working for him in the White House and then most importantly, accompanying him to his ranch to help him on his memoirs, the last years of his life. And it was an extraordinary time because I really did develop empathy for him. He was so sad. He knew that his domestic legacy had been cut into, rightfully so, by the war in Vietnam. But I must say now, looking back 50 years at what he accomplished in those first 18 months, it's really extraordinary. Civil Rights Act desegregating the South, voting rights, fair housing, Medicare, Medicaid, aid to education, immigration reform, Head Start, NPR, PBS. I mean, it, it, our foundation of our social life and our economic justice in many ways goes back to him. So that he knew that, but he also knew that then the war was not just a shadow, it was the entire atmosphere. And so I was there, and I'm not sure why he chose me to talk to him. Um, he spent many hours with me. I like to believe sometimes it was because I was a good listener. And he was a great storyteller, these fabulous, colorful, anecdotal stories. There was a problem with them. I later discovered that half of them weren't true, but they were great. <laughs> and, but my favorite moment is that I, when I was wondering why is he spending so much time with me, I was worried that I was then a young woman and he had somewhat of a minor league womanizing reputation. So I was constantly talking to him about steady boyfriends, even when I had no boyfriends at all. Everything was perfect until one day he said he wanted to discuss our relationship which sounded ominous when he took me nearby to the lake, conveniently called Lakeland, Baines Johnson. Wine, cheese, red jet table, all the romantic trappings. And he starts out, Doris, more than any other woman I have ever known, and my heart sank. And then he said, you remind me of my mother. <laughs> Pretty embarrassing. But, but I must say, I, I included him with these other three people in this book because I do think that what, not only what he did in, in all the great society and civil rights legislation, but now looking back on how he was able to get bipartisan legislation over and over again through the Congress, how he understood the Congress, how he brought them to a common purpose. It's been so long since we've had that, and I just wanted people to remember that it can be done. In fact, one of the, the goals of the book is to just remember that these times seemed so terrible to the people who lived in them, Worst, I think, than our times seem to us today. I mean, imagine if you're living in the 1861 period when Abraham Lincoln comes into power and the country's already falling apart and splitting apart, literally, and there's gonna be more than 600,000 of your fellow citizens that will die, and while you're living in it, you don't know how it's gonna end. I mean, that's important for us right now to remember. We know it ended with slavery being undone, with the Union coming back together, but they didn't know that at the time. Or if you're living in Teddy Roosevelt's time, and the economy was much more shaken up than by the tech and globalization revolution today. The working class felt split off from the capitalists. There was a lot of immigration coming in. The rural areas felt split off from the cities. There were lots of inventions that made people feel the, the pace of life was changing. And the working class was in real rebellion. There was nationwide strikes, bombs in the streets. And we didn't know how that would end either. There was a fear that a revolution might take place. And of course, with the depression, when people's bank accounts can't even be taken the deposits out of them, the banks are collapsing, people don't have jobs, there's hungry people in the streets, and then eventually World War II, how did we know that that would end the right way? So, and even with Lyndon Johnson, with the assassination of JFK, with the worry it was a conspiracy, with the civil rights movement really heating up with violence, 
and no thought that the Civil Rights Bill would ever get through the Congress because of the Southern filibuster, all those people felt they were living in really tough times. But in each one of those circumstances, we had leaders who helped us get through those times. They had a mission that made us feel a sense of common purpose, that made us work together for that. And there were citizens who were actively working at the same time. Lincoln was called a liberator. They said, don't call me that. It's the anti-slavery movement that did it all. Without the progressive movement, the people in the settlement houses, the social gospel, um, FDR and Teddy couldn't have done what they did. Without the civil rights movement, there's no question LBJ couldn't have. And then there's the women's movement, the gay rights movement. So I think my best, best hope for the book is that people will, feeling as we are, that these perhaps are the worst of times, that, that it's up to us, really, as citizens, to make sure that that's not too, and to do, and we can talk about this as we go on, what we need to do to, to, change, to change this political structure of ours is very unhealthy. And it needs a revolution in a certain sense. And there are answers to it. FDR said problems made by man can be solved by man. And I'm just hoping if we look back at history, and I know John shares this same feeling, and, you, and his, we ignore history at our peril because it can give us perspective, it can give us reassurance. And I've never felt history was more important than it is now so that we can make people feel, yes, it's going to be all right. I really believe that. And I, I hope everybody else does too. The, um How, how did your relationship with the Johnsons and being in that ambient atmosphere, how do you think that affected not the book on Johnson, but your other books? How did, how did your personal experience with people who had had enormous power, ultimate power, do you think, did it make you more sympathetic? Did it make, how, how did that, applying that not repertorial experience exactly, but applying that cultural experience of realizing that these were people, not characters. They were characters, not caricatures. I, I think that's right. I mean, I think I, I'd been a judge of Lyndon Johnson, I think, before I met him from the outside in. And I think if I had stayed in the academic world at Harvard, I probably would have remained a judge if I had not known him. You know, just thinking about him from my perspective of what I wished he had done and then judging whether he did that or not. And then just seeing him in those last years and, and watching how he himself was suffering under the decisions he made and listening to him talk about how he made those decisions. And even though I was working on the memoirs, I was lucky to just be working on two chapters on Congress and civil rights. So when he talked to me, he would come alive. He was so happy to talk about the things that had fulfilled him. When he talked to my fellow memoir workers about Vietnam or foreign policy, you could just, his voice would drop to a whisper and you could see the impact it had on him. Of course, it had a terrible impact on all the people who died and on our country as well, which is larger than that. But I think it did make me empathetic toward the people that I would then study. It made me a presidential historian. My original field when I went became a White House fellow was Supreme Court history. I wrote my PhD thesis on the Supreme Court. And I think- There's I'm, plenty to work on now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd have these guys in their robes instead of, <laughs> but, um, but I think what it did then was because of that extraordinary privilege, which I realized later of being able to talk and listen to the voice and watch the emotion in an actually live person. When I went to all the people who had died, um, as, as we historians do, you, you, you find whatever you can that gives you that intimacy of tone. And the reason I could never write about a present person is I want letters and diaries. I mean, letters are the most wonderful thing. You can feel like you're looking over the shoulder of a person. I mean, for example, when I was working on the Lincoln book, Seward, his Secretary of State, had lived in Washington during the Civil War, but his wife was living in Auburn, New York. So there's just hundreds and hundreds of letters that he wrote to her. So they'd be emotional about, I hope we see the same moon outside and I miss you, but then all the gossip of the day is in the letters and you feel like you're listening to him. And all of those cabinet members, they wrote letters, they kept diaries. Um, so when you go through the primary stuff as an historian, you're trying to recreate the intimacy that I actually knew. So it gave me an incredible model to try and see, I wanna bring these guys to life the same way that I, Johnson was alive and I think it just set a much too high standard, which you can almost always hope to reach, but not quite, so that your main goal is that you'll feel sad when they die, 
and you hope the reader will feel the same thing, whatever they felt about them, because they'd lived with them for a period of time. And because my books take so long, I mean, it took me longer than, than, than it took the Civil War to be fought to write the Lincoln book, <laughs> twice as long as, 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 the, as the World War II to write the FDR book. So I really am, and Eleanor, of course, I really am living with these people and feel like they're part of my life. Somebody was teasing me that they were the other man in my life beside <laughs> my husband during this period of time. But I think it sent me to the understanding that details matter, that conversations, if they're recorded from somebody else, um, of course, Johnson had his tapes, which, which helped a lot. Besi even besides talking to him, the tapes, which I didn't have full access to when I wrote the book, we had them for the memoirs, but they're the best way to bring him alive. You know, the, the, um, those, they, the, he's come back to, I think, to people's understanding more. When you listen to those tapes, you hear that he's not just yelling at somebody, he's charming, he's, he's trying to make them feel that they'll feel better about themselves when he talks to Dirksen. You can hear on these things, he's promising him everything under the sun. If you come with me and you bring Republicans to help break that filibuster on civil rights to desegregate the South, whatever you want, Dirksen, you know, an ambassadorship, you want a postmastership in Peoria, I'll come to Springfield, I'll come anywhere you want. But then he says to him, but you know what, Everett, if you come with me on this bill, you'll be remembered over time. 200 years from now, school children will know only two names, Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. <laughs> He's a great man. Great man. So uh, Woodrow Wilson once said that the president, by law and custom, is able to be as big a man as he can, or as small. What, what do you say to people today who say you have spent decades writing about recapturing the legacy, lives and legacies of people at the top who for all their faults, by common agreement I think, did in fact try to follow our better angels more often than our worst instincts. They didn't always get it right, but at least there was a North Star there. And that seems to be, I think, without being partisan about it, it's very hard to say, to point to anything in the incumbent record that this is someone who was trying to reach beyond the base, this is someone who was empathetic, this is someone who was humble. And it's a little like what Jack Kennedy said, there's a reason Profiles and Courage was one volume. <laughs> you know, uh, so the Trump chapter of this would, would maybe you'll have it for the ebook, uh, <laughs> but it, maybe not. What do, you, what do we do in an era where the presidency does not appear to be part of that moral calculus that has in fact lifted us to higher ground despite all our faults. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing we need to worry about the most. I mean, forgetting partisan divide right now, that what you need in a leader, which I sort of touched on before, is somebody who grows in office first. And that means to grow in office, you have to have the humility to know that you need to grow in office. Um, you know, one of the things that President Trump said that was so interesting. He said the reason he loved um, Pope Francis so very, very much was because Pope Francis was very, very humble, just like Donald Trump. <laughs> it was just an impossible thought to imagine. But more importantly, he said once that he had the very best temperament of anybody who might run for office because he never lost. He always won. All my guys lost. And he lost too. Of course, he had bankruptcies that must have been difficult. What you need is that reflection, I think, upon things that you lose so that you can learn what you win. Um, but I think what you pointed out is the important thing, is what you hope for when a leader gets in there. It's an amazing job to be president of the United States. It's the most extraordinary possibility. I mean, we've seen presidents who failed at the same thing. Buchanan failed where Lincoln succeeded. The country was falling apart. And then he's able to, to do what he needs to. Lincoln did, but Buchanan stoked the divisions and made them worse. Obviously, Herbert Hoover wasn't able to deal with the Depression, and FDR was. So it's not just the chance of getting the opportunity, but it's the capacity to be ready for that opportunity and to have some sort of moral compass of where you want to take the country. Um, to be fair to President Trump, the situation he came into was already divided. The cultural divide was there with people in the rural areas feeling cut off from people in the cities, with the people who were not able to be mobile in our society because we haven't given them the chance to uh, that upward ladder. 
Um, I think the most important thing we haven't done is education to make that teachers feel that they have a chance to make those kids just as LBJ wanted to when he was young. We just need more for our teachers. We need more for our education system. He, he came in at a time when, when the, the, the congressional districts were drawn in a certain way, so there's left and right. It would have been very hard for anybody, I think, to unify the country, to be fair. But then what you're looking for is the person who has those qualities that once he comes in, he says, now is my time to be president of all the people. And for some reason, instead of going around the country as Teddy Roosevelt did, he went on a train every spring and every fall to places he'd lost as well as places he won. And he was talking about the fact that the rock of democracy would founder unless people who lived in other sections and other parties and other religions saw each other as common American citizens rather than the other. So we went around the country preaching common duties. And that's what we would have hoped that President Trump might have done. But I think in the end, we feel a sense of unmoredness right now because of a lack of political truth. I mean, where are the words that we trust? I mean, what was so great about Franklin Roosevelt was that he established a bond of trust with the American people through his communication. I mean, they all communicated in the way of their time. Lincoln was lucky to live in a time when the written word was king. His speeches could be reread and, and read in country farms and city homes, and so his language was perfect. Um, Teddy, with those punchy language, comes on with the national newspaper. They all fit the technology of their time. You know, speak softly and carry a big stick. Um, don't hit until you have to, and then hit hard. Or he even gave Maxwell House the slogan, good to the very last drop. But then FDR comes on with the age of radio, and he had that intimacy of tone. It wasn't just his voice, which was perfect for radio. It was that he kept picturing individual citizens. So when he's practicing his, 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 his fireside chats, he's picturing a shop girl behind the counter, a mason, a construction worker. And then he zeroes in on that person, making them feel part of whatever he's explaining. And those fireside chats were teaching. He would explain why the banks had collapsed, what we had to do about it, why you had to bring your money back to the banks. Those are really dense fireside chats. They're not just simple things. He put them in simple language. He, he liked to only speak in one syllables, if you could. But they, they connected him. There's a story of a construction worker coming home one night. And his partner said, where are you going? He said, well, my president is coming to speak to me in my living room. It's only right I'd be there to greet him when he comes. <laughs> And then when he died, people said they felt lonely somehow, that after he had died, he was their friend. And that's because he established trust in his word. That very first inaugural, people felt, we can get through this. The confidence was built. And, and that's the sense, I think, when we're in a time where there's no political truth, when there's alternative facts, when there's, there's actual fabrications going on, when there's divided networks in the cable, there's social media that's dividing us. Without that sense of trusting in the word, and when a president is fighting with the press and calling them the enemies of the people, then truth gets dissipated, and we don't have a sense of direction of where we're going. But I guess I would argue that in the end, what we really need from our president, and what I'm not sure we're seeing so far, and I keep hoping that something will change at that moment when he says, I'm president, this is the time to unify the country, but it's all a matter of character. I mean, the thing that struck me the most about Abraham Lincoln is when he was believing, as I said, all his life that he wanted to be remembered after he died. And I couldn't bear to finish the Team of Rivals book with Lincoln's death. I just, I, I get so sad when they're dying. So I wanted to find something else that could end the book. And I found this wonderful interview with Leo Tolstoy, the great Russian writer, to a New York newspaper man at the turn of the 20th century. And Tolstoy said he'd just come back from a remote area of the Caucasus where there are a group of wild barbarians, and they never left this part of Russia. So they were so excited to have Tolstoy in their midst, they asked him to tell stories of the great men of history. So I told them about Napoleon and Alexander the Great and Frederick the Great and Julius Caesar, and they seemed to love it. But before I finished, the chief of the barbarians stood up and said, but wait, you haven't told us about the greatest ruler of them all. We want to hear about that man who spoke with the voice of thunder, who laughed like the sunrise, who came from that place called America that is so far from here, that if a young man should travel there, he'd be an old man when he arrived. Tell us of that man, tell us of Abraham Lincoln. Tolstoy said he was stunned to know that Lincoln's name had reached this corner, but then the newspaper reporter said, so what made Lincoln so great after all? After he said he had told the barbarians everything he could about Lincoln, he said, well, he wasn't as great a general as Napoleon, perhaps not as great a statesman as Frederick the Great, but his greatness consisted in the integrity of his character.
And that, in the end, is how we should judge our leaders. And that is what I fear is, is something that is missing in Washington today. I mean, it seems like something's happened to these parties where the party identification has become more important than their identification with the country. And I don't even fully understand it. I mean, there was some statistic I saw the other day that people would be more worried if their child married outside the party, even than religion now. <laughs> and that's crazy. I mean, it's just, um, I, I, it's the hyper-partisanship and putting your party before your country, before the Senate, before the institution that you're part of. It's that ambition for self. I'd rather, if I were elected to Congress right now and I had to vote against, you would hope that if it was your friend elected to Congress, they'd vote against whatever, they'd vote for what they believed in rather than what that would keep them in power. Go out in, in glory rather than stay there and have to hide your convictions in order to win again. But again, just to go back to it, it has to do with things we can change. There are things going through the states now for nonpartisan commissions in four different states instead of the gerrymandering. There are there are constitutional amendments starting in the states to end Citizens United and overturn it. We can do that. My own thing that I, we were talking about at lunch that I care so much about is I wish if we need to feel a sense of people in other parts of the country feeling similar to the people in the cities if they're living in the rural areas, we know that military service creates that sense of a common mission and a common destiny. My own son joined the military right after 9-11. And he said he will never, ever forget what it was like to be in Iraq and Afghanistan in those years when he was a platoon leader, earned a Bronze Star, and he had a common mission with kids from all over the country. And he's very much in favor now of a national service program at home. That if we had kids from... Um, I mean, just just think, of, think of it. Suppose, you know, like Peace Corps families, you go abroad and you live with a host family. Suppose we had a host family in Tennessee here hosting somebody from a city in California or, or somebody in a city area hosting a rural person. Um, and then they were working on disaster relief or teaching. There's so many more applicants for the teacher corps than, than they can possibly take. If we put money into that so that young kids between high school and vocational school or college, they get a sense of living and see the person as a person rather than as the other, that younger generation, it's their rendezvous with destiny to break this fever we're in right now. And I think if these guys came back, I know Eleanor Roosevelt was for it, Teddy Roosevelt was for it, and there are answers to these problems. I just think we have to feel, we have, that's, that's what, again what I hope, we have to imagine that we can have a different political system than the one that has fallen to us right now. If we can't imagine it, we're gonna think this is normal, what we're living through. That went a long way from the question you asked me, I'm sorry, <laughs> just sort of floated uh, around. No, no. Go forth again, so. <laughs> so, to what extent do you think our national problems are a reflection of who we are or a distortion of who we are? That is, this is a book about leadership, but I think, in reading it, that all of the lessons here are just as applicable to all of us. I do too. Because aren't politicians more often mirrors of who we are rather than molders? I think that's right. I mean, I think it, it is a collective mirror on ourselves that these are the leaders that we've chosen and that they are not able to get done what we hope they can get done. So we have, to look, we have to look at ourselves and figure out, are we really as active as we could be right now? Are we being spectators? Are we just sitting back and thinking, this is not the way we want our system to work? Um, and I think our lives are so, so frenetic right now um, in work, in play, in, in our kids, that it doesn't seem like sometimes there's time for politics. In the 19th century, politics was the major sporting event. I mean, those, those, and it was great to have people so involved and engaged in public life. I mean, when, when they'd go to the debates with Stephen Douglas, there could be thousands of people there for six-hour debates. You know, and the, the, the audience would be part of the debate. You know, just as we do in football games, they literally would yell then, hit him again, harder, harder. You know, and then the people, they respond back. There's one moment when somebody yells at Lincoln, you're two-faced, and he immediately responds, if I had two faces, do you think I'd be wearing this face? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> You know, it's that, I keep looking for that self-deprecating humor among our politicians, and it's very rare to see right now. They somehow feel that acknowledging error is a sign of weakness rather than a sign of strength. And, and you know, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt had that same self-deprecating humor. There's somebody did a review of his uh, memoir on the Spanish-American War, 
And they said he did have a tendency to want to be in the center of attention wherever he was. His, his daughter, Alice, as you know, said he wanted to be the baby at the baptism and the bride at the wedding and the corpse at the funeral. <laughs> um, so when this person wrote a review of his book about the Spanish-American War, they said he, wanted, he placed himself in the center of every little action, of every battle of the entire war. He should have called the book Alone in Cuba. <laughs> so everybody's laughing all over the country because this is a famous journalist, humorist. And what does he do? He writes the journalist. He said, I regret to tell you that my wife and my intimate friends are absolutely delighted with your review of my book. <laughs> now you owe me one. I've always wanted to meet you. I mean, that's the way you can just deal with life. I mean, these yeah. are things for all of us. The qualities that make a good leader are human qualities. You make a promise, you keep it. Um, your word is your bond. Um, you build a team around you with people who can argue with you and question your assumptions. I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt was the thorn in Franklin's side. I mean, he said, you know, she would constantly question his assumptions and, and be willing to argue with him. We need that even in our own lives, somebody that tells us the truth of what we're doing right or wrong. I mean, she was able to, you know, she sent so many memos to General Marshall during World War II that he had to assign a separate general whose only task was to deal with her memos on discrimination. <laughs> she has a weekly press conference where she only invites female reporters, so all over the country, stuffy publishers have to hire their first female reporter. Entire generation gets their start because of her. But more importantly, she was able to, to be there with him and tell him when things weren't right, to be his moral compass in many ways when he was being a politician. All of these things are things we as human beings need. So I think leadership is not some subject out there. It's really, what is leadership about? It's human nature. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt said the best way to learn about leaders is to read books, because you read about the way people treat each other. You read through the novels and the great, and the great plays. You're going to read about human nature, and that's what we need to do. So I think we just have to, we are feeling very nervous at this period of time. We're, we're just stunned at looking at our televisions day after day. We have to imagine that we might wake up in another time, um, and hopefully it's not a long period of time from now, where it's changed somehow, and that this has been considered an area of period of time that we got through. Yeah. And I know you believe that, right, too? You're my buddy, and you believe I, it, too. I do, I do, and not only because of that, but yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, if we'd been sitting here 50 years ago today, 46 Americans would have died in Vietnam, not wounded, not captured, killed. Right. Just buried Senator Kennedy, just buried Dr. King, just come out of Chicago, and we'd be nine days away from George Wallace winning 13.5% of the popular vote and carrying five states. Right. Five. On an explicitly segregationist platform 50 years ago today. So, yeah. Thanks. But we're getting old. We don't wait for 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> 50 used to seem like a lot, I must say. Uh, that's changed. I, I'm a big believer, too, in that, that we're far more responsible, complicit in this than, than we like to think sometimes, partly because of the Will Rogers story about uh, he's at a congressional debate in Oklahoma in a district, and uh, a candidate gets up and says, you know what, I just think my opponent is a lying, thieving, adulterating son of a bitch. And his opponent says, yes, I'm quite representative of my district. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think, I think there's, a lot of, there's a lot of complicity to go around here. Um, the other story, and I want to say this before we wrap up, um, uh, I just want to say a word of, of thanks publicly to Doris for the life and legacy of her husband, uh, Richard Goodwin, who... Um, who told me once that you know, he was an American poet. He really was. He, 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 he wrote some of the most important oratory uh, since the Second World War, uh, the, spe the We Shall Overcome speech after Selma, the Ripples of Hope speech for Senator Kennedy. Uh, although the Selma speech, is important to note, is the finest piece of prose ever written on a hangover. <laughs> uh, because he was, can I tell the story? Sure. So, so this tells you everything about you need it. So, so <laughs> Dick is upset because the first person who gets assigned the speech after Selma, after John Lewis is nearly killed, uh, it's for Monday night, it's eight days after uh, Bloody Sunday, and they give it to a Texas public relations guy. Was it Busby? Horace Busby. Horace Busby. Um, 
if you want to come to sort of Dorks Anonymous, we're actually, <laughs> we're leading it. We drink coffee. We have 12 steps. It's great. Um, if you're here, you're a candidate. Trust me. Uh, let's, let's be honest. So, so this guy writes a terrible speech. Good would have been, to put it kindly, pissed off that he hadn't been given the speech. Right. It was a Sunday night that Johnson decided to give a speech Monday night to a joint session of Congress. So Dick's at Schlesinger's house, having the brandy and the wine or whatever we're talking about, and he picks up his phone and there's no call for him. So he said, well, I guess someone else is writing a speech. So he comes leisurely in the next morning. It's going to be given that night. And Johnson's screaming, how's Goodwin doing on the speech? And then they say, well, it was assigned to Horace Busby. And what? Get Goodwin to work on that speech. He had only that day to work on that speech. And great line. I mean, the other thing that Johnson's always, you gave me a Southern Baptist from Texas. I need a Jew from Brooklyn to tell me. <laughs> But he was a, a great man, and if you have not read Remembering America, which is, I think, the best book about the 1960s, it was is Dick's book about that. And there's but, two things, if I may please. say, really, that I think are so important about, the most important thing is that we, we've known each other for 45 years, and we were married for 42 years, and it was the adventure of a lifetime. And part of the reason I, I came on this book tour, and I'm so glad to be here today with all of you, is I just was so afraid that I'd be lonely at home after all those years. And now it's turned out that my son, who teaches um, history and literature in my high school, where he went in Concord, Massachusetts, has moved into my house with all the books with our two grandchildren, eight and 10. So now I'm just so lonely wanting to be back with him. <laughs> but, I'm, but meanwhile, I, I guess the two things that are so important, I think, about my husband's legacy are one, that he chose public service for most of his life. I mean, here was this young kid, came from a relatively, the father was, was no job during the Depression, and so money was always an issue. And he graduates first in his class at Harvard Law School, editor of the Law Review, clerks for Justice Frankfurter, all these law firms are after him. And he decides, I just don't want to transfer money from one place to another. So he later told the Harvard Law Review banquet his entire life was an attempt to escape the practice of law. And so he first goes and does the investigation of the rigged television quiz shows, which becomes that movie quiz show. But more importantly, then, is a young speechwriter, the second speechwriter with Sorensen on the plane with John F. Kennedy. And then when John F. Kennedy dies, he stays with LBJ. And as John said, I mean, the Great Society speech, the Howard University speech on affirmative action, the We Shall Overcome speech was still the most extraordinary speech. You know, every now and then, history and fate meet at a certain point at a certain time. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was at Appomattox. So it was in Selma, Alabama. But then there's something so relevant for today. He said, there's no Southern problem. There's no Northern problem. There's no white problem. There's no Negro problem. There is only an American problem. There's no constitutional issue here. There's really no moral issue here because there's only right and wrong. And it is wrong to deny Negro Americans the right to vote. And then he goes back to Catula. He, the only time he bothered my husband that day, because he knew he had to write the speech in that six or eight hour time frame, um, was to call him up and said, I'd like to talk about my experience at Catula, which he had told Dick about. So, he call, so Dick wrote in and then Johnson delivered it. So he said, I, I, in, he talked about his experience of seeing these Mexican American kids and the pain of prejudice on their faces. And then he said, I never thought then in 1928 that I'd be standing here in 1965 and able to do something possibly to help the sons and daughters of those kids. But let me, in your, let, me, let, me let you in on a secret. I have that power now, and I mean to use it. It was so powerful. And then eight weeks later, the Voting Rights Act passes. But I think the most thing I'm so proud of of my husband, and I think it's something that if only more people today would be able to do, he, nothing will ever equal for him what that first 18 months was like with all that legislation coming through. And he was so much a part, not just of the speeches, but of all the policy making on civil rights and social justice and Medicare. And yet, as the war started heating up, he decided that he saw that the war was eating up the energy of the great society, and he left. And so he left, and even then, there were times when people thought, you can't do this, you can't leave. Now, Johnson said he would, he would draft him he was gonna, if, he, if he left. Um, and he, said, I, he said, I don't think you have that power. He said, I have that power. <laughs> so anyway. Um, he finally left, and then as he got outside, he became more and more concerned about the war, and he began to write and talk about the war. And one of the Johnson higher-ups came up to him and said, you know, Dick, you have a really good future in, in, in public life, but you're burning your bridges now. You're, 
you're, you're biting the hand that fed you. And so my husband said, they didn't feed me, I fed myself. But much more importantly, he felt it was his duty as a citizen to have loyalty to the country over loyalty to his own career at that point in time. And that's what we need on our people right now. Us? Read that oh. to us and we'll okay. close with Thank that. Thank you. I'm glad I could talk about him because I miss him and when I can talk about him with you, he comes back. Um, it is my hope that these stories of leadership in times of fracture and fear will prove instructive and reassuring. These men set a standard and a bar for all of us, just as they learn from one another so we can learn from them, and from them gain a better perspective on the discord of our times. For leadership does not exist in a void. Leadership is a two-way street. I have only been an instrument, Lincoln insisted, with both accuracy and modesty. The anti-slavery people of the country and the army have done it all. The progressive movement helped pave the way for Theodore Roosevelt's square deal, much as the civil rights movement provided the fuel to ignite the righteous and pragmatic activism that enabled the great society. And no one communicated with people and heard their voices more clearly than Franklin Roosevelt. He absorbed their stories, listened carefully, and for a generation held a nonstop conversation with the people. With public sentiment, nothing can fail, Abraham Lincoln said. Without it, nothing can succeed. Such a leader is inseparably linked to the people. Such leadership is a mirror in which the people see their collective reflection. Doris Goodwin. Exactly.